Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What's the date? Friday? The 20th. April, April. 20th. Friday. Already. And, and snow was on the ground yesterday. But Just I heard to definitively me. on the radio this morning. Snow is done. Weathercasters say the snow is done. They were confident enough to give a season total of snow. Uh, we're past it. And Brian's shaking his head saying, no, there's going to be more snow. <laughs> so I have a funny little story to tell you. <clears throat> this class in our calendar says body stress fractures, which just makes me laugh because it was supposed to say business stress fractures. Fracture. So I'm sure that was something I did because I always screw up the words. And um, but this class is business stress fractures. That's not easy, easy to say. You, yeah. That's not easy to say. So, but I think I think we'll have fun with this topic. I say that every time, but I think it's going to make sense, especially when you're thinking about your business and critiquing it and wondering how do we how do we analyze? What is that? What does that look like? What does that feel like? feel like because many times a stress fracture isn't obvious. So we're going to talk about that. Okay. So let's do the definition first. Do you want to say good morning more? Yeah, good, good morning. You know, I think that while a stress fracture in your body may not be obvious, I think a stress factor in business is extremely obvious. No, no, it's not. And you're going to see, see why as we go along. All right. So let's do the definition. And I hate that our font is not our font. You, you know, I say that every time. Okay. All right, so just it's not the Terry Collins font. It is our font. It's PSC font. So stress fractures. All right, here's the definition: is a fatigue-induced fracture of the bone caused by repeated stress over time, instead of resulting from a single severe impact, which is so obvious when you absolutely break something. Stress fractures are the result of accumulated trauma, repeated activities. Well, so you're doing it over and over and over again, and you might not even be aware mm -hmm. that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. watch. I still disagree. Okay, good. But but let's let's apply it to our businesses and and see. Street fractures. How did I do that? <laughs> oh my God, what is wrong with me? Well, what? It's stress fractures. A stress fracture is overuse injury. So we could be pushing the business and the service beyond its means. It occurs when muscles become fatigued and are unable to absorb the added shock of, and that could be scheduling problems, hours of operation, not enough people to uh, support staff. You're gonna understand where we're gonna go with this in a moment. But absorbing the shock, what is the shock to the business? And usually you can see it in the hospitality industry when there's not enough help on. We were at a, uh, an Applebee's just recently <clears throat> and we had really good service, and then all of a sudden they got hit, they got slammed, mm -hmm. and the server just couldn't respond to the shock of, of the traffic. They didn't have enough people on, and people were doing the best they could, but it was obvious that they were in, they were in a stressful situation. Uh, pain with activity. Here's why so many times people don't know they have a stress fracture. It's because they use it all day, then they rest at night, and the pain subsides with rest. In business, what do we do every day? The pain subsides with drinking. In business, <laughs> what happens? The day ends. The day ends, we close, and we go, okay, okay, everyone's gone, thank you, and we're all breathing and saying, what was that? And Okay, but it's done. And then we go home and we rest. But what did we need to learn from it? Mm -hmm. Should we have gotten help? Should we have talked about it? Should we have said, that was horrible yesterday and we're doing it to ourselves over and over again. How are we going to correct it? Well, and to some degree, I've been, I've been thinking about this since you wrote the program where it says a stress fracture is an overuse injury. Um, sometimes I think stress in business comes from underuse of the resources that are available. Perhaps. So it overuses one particular person or one part of the business. And, and it's sometimes from not following the systems that we have in place. Mark, but wait a minute. Which what would about, allow it to function. What about when we say do you, your traffic warrants front desk service assistance? Mm -hmm. And what do they say? Well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have it. Right. And then what did we say? What does that do to your service commitment to the customer in the chair when you have to be interrupted? 
What are you doing for that? So it is, it is creating shock in the service. Well, we'll give you another example. What happens when you've got a staff that doesn't reschedule future reservations? That phone has to ring. And that phone has to ring and ring and ring and ring mm -hmm. and at, at non-predictable times. And so you're, you're chasing after something that there was a system in place that could mitigate that. For a reason. It. For a reason. Right. And then people decided to not use the system. They made decisions. And that created a stress fraction in many businesses. Even mm -hmm. ours. Right? And so when you, when you do this, you put the system in place. And remember, if you think back to Michael Gerber's book, The e -Myth, the entrepreneur has the vision. The, uh, the managers put systems in place so the business can operate with ease. And then the technicians or the frontline people deliver the service. As soon as the frontline creates a, a tension point between the system and the actual delivery, that's when the business is pushed. That's when it can't absorb the shock. Mm -hmm. And as much as you want to say, you know, what did it hurt? They didn't sell take home. What didn't, what did it hurt? This is the, the, uh, the hairdresser saying, so I didn't sell take home, you know, the world's not gonna end. I didn't reschedule, the world's not gonna end. They don't understand the stress points that creates everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardship of it. Um, not being able to understand is because they don't understand the whys. And I, I completely agree with that still. I was talking to Joseph DiMaggio the other day and he said, remember the why. Why do we do the why? And I jumped in and I said, have you ever heard you do the why to make them wise? And he said, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. When people don't understand the why, they shouldn't be ridiculed for not understanding the why. Or they shouldn't be ridiculed because you never told them the why. There's two things that happen there. Okay, so. But they should if you told them the why over and over oh. again and they've chosen not to. So, so what do you do about it? You just turn your head the other way, put your head in the sand and say, I guess we didn't really mean that system. Um, you know, it was, you don't re have to reschedule because it just, we're not going to talk about it anyway. Come on. So where do they live in our business? That's, where, that's what you want to think about here. And we're, we're going to go into a lot of places. We're going to give you examples the whole way down. So where do stress fractures live in your business? All right? The first one I thought of is the inconsistency of the system, inconsistency of the delivery. I went into a salon, and, and I, I walked in the door, and they all, yeah, I, oh, I know the owners will never accept that as a greeting. Yet yeah, it was done, and I said to them, um, "May I look around?" And and they didn't say, "Well, allow us to show you around, right?" They said, "Yeah, go go ahead." And the inconsistency of the expectation of the service. Now I know leadership wasn't there that day, mm -hmm. in, in a role to inspect, but those people decided to be inconsistent. They decided. Well, make that decision. And the reality is, is that in business, as, as leaders of the business, you can't be there 24-7. You can't be there every moment that the business <laughs> is open well, and personally deliver the, the service. And so you trust your service ethic. You trust that through other people. And, and yet, are we investing enough time with those other people, as Terry said, to understand the why to make them wise? If they understand the reason why the system is in place and then they choose not to do it that's a big issue but if they're choosing not to do it because they don't understand are why you, it's are important. you defending the way they said hello you don't think they knew no. the whys uh, yeah i think they probably did all right i think they probably did so what do you think they did i mean of course it was addressed and discussed and so on and so forth yeah but the, but the reality is is that our systems are delivered through others yeah that's what makes business sometimes messy. That's what makes... Sloppy, yes. You're right. Yeah. So when we look at inconsistency, that's one word, but where are you inconsistent? That's time that you have to spend with yourself and say, when are we inconsistent? I was cleaning the kitchen just now, and I thought, seriously? Other people, I followed someone else cleaning the kitchen, and I pulled out the coffee pot and about fainted. So everyone else was wiping around the coffee pot, 
decided not to pull the coffee pot machine out and wash all around it. Those are choices. Those are choices not to do that. That's not inconsistency sometimes, but it's inconsistent. Well, yes, it, it is. is. Inconsistency. Inconsistency, inconsistency of the choices, right? So what's, what's the plan? Where, where, where does the stress live in my business that I don't have a plan? I have all these ideas, but I never get the plan on paper. I never put the plan in place. I've always got, I'm an ideas person without any implementation. That could be your stress fractures. Without me, we would fail. Well, how many owners can still carry the productivity of the salon? That we meet the majority. And, and sometimes say, you know, I, I made more money when I work for someone else. What does that do to you on a daily basis, right? That's got to eat away at you. Pricing, that's a stress fracture. They say, well, we haven't raised our prices and we don't know how to. So they defend the stress of not raising the pricing. Inventory, we don't do it. Right. Under the premise that we either don't understand or don't understand the importance of it. There have, been, there have been many times where I've seen a salon that struggled or, or was concerned about covering next week's payroll, and, and yet they've got more than next week's payroll and excess inventory sitting in their business. And, and, and that's a choice. But we're not necessarily overseeing the person or people who place the orders, or we put a, a antiquated min-max system in place to, to do our ordering without any look toward what's the right amount of inventory to have on here. I think that that's amazing. I mean, how many times have we looked at a PL and the same inventory is listed? It's a plug number on it. Plug number and yeah. just carry it over year after year. All right, so now you look at effort. We saw a great documentary um, last Saturday or Sunday of a, of a basketball player who I had never heard of. Norman? Was it Norman? Something no, Norman? Something it Norman. Could have been, yeah. So this guy, I mean, in high school was it was amazing, and uh, he and in was, college was something special. Yeah, really. I mean, sometimes what did he average in college? Twenty eight points a game or something, and uh, the amount of rebounds. But his effort, he no one, he wouldn't show up to practice, or if he'd show up to practice, he'd just read the newspaper. He didn't think that the rules applied to him because of his stats in a game. He didn't think anything applied to him. He didn't have to follow the rules. He didn't have to follow the system because the numbers he was putting up. He had no idea how that affected his reputation, how, how the other team members didn't want to work with him, didn't want to honor him. And that's, that's what's difficult. That's what's hard, right? So effort could be something that's creating a lot of stress in your business. I don't have to go to education. I don't have to be part of a meeting. I don't have to train. I don't have to show up 15 minutes before my first guests arrive. Um, I don't have to sell take home because I do so much in service. And there's, there's so much that could be excuse driven. And that goes down to the next one, which is talent. What does my talent look like in my business? Mm -hmm. And that can create stress. I mean, you constantly have to be looking at where are we? What is, what is the kind of talent and the noise that we're putting out there? We, I met with a, a top salon this week and she lost two people and she said, I had no idea the stress they were creating in my business. Two people. Isn't, isn't it funny that that usually shows up after the person is gone? Oh yeah, because it's so obvious mm -hmm. that it's not present any longer. And, and it also, going back to effort, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain this. I, I don't know how to teach it sometimes. But the fact that there's some people that look for ways to get out of work versus saying, what can I help with? People that will not volunteer. People that will not say, how can I ease the load? On your, they only think about themselves, and that's really hard, and it's very difficult. And and I know that that sometimes um, people think, well, you didn't ask. If you would have asked, I would have helped. But and some people ask and don't have to wait to be asked. They lean in beforehand. 
Well, the current generation that, that exists in most of our businesses will do most anything for us, but they do have to be asked. They do have to be invited to do that. And it's just a, it's a shift in the mm -hmm. way people think. And, and it can create a stress fracture because sometimes as leaders, we're waiting for them to uh, volunteer. And, and we're disappointed when they don't, yet they would have happily uh, participated had we invited them. So you've got this juxtaposition that's taking place. We just have, again, if we're looking backwards at the business and saying, where is some of this stress coming from? And then addressing it, I, I think that's, that's the positive. Well, I, I had an, a conversation with one of our team members this week and said, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about my stress, it just, other people just look down. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Bypass me. And she said, how, uh, how can I not take that person? Well, yeah, and, but at the same time, we say all the time that everybody's got stuff. And so maybe that look down is, don't pick me, maybe that look down is them thinking about their stuff as well. Those are, those are interesting and I'm sure very unique situations all across the board. Oh, the dynamics of it are, are intensely complicated. What, what uh, Terry and I say all the time uh, is, a, is a quote that we learned, and that's that it's, it's the team member's responsibility to manage the effort, and it's the coach's responsibility to manage the talent. And, and I, I think it's interesting that these two things are together on the slide because effort is, is, is the team member. Talent is the coach. But if either one of those two things lets down, uh, you're going to have a stress fracture in your business. Well, what did that guy say now that he's a... Uh, 65 year old man he said i was terrible my attitude was terrible yeah i mean no uh, wonder, no hindsight wonder hindsight can be very cruel but it usually is very honest and and uh you know it's it's choosing and i think that this exists in business too i mean with with any decision with any space that you're in right now um uh, yeah, I think you want to live your life in, in saying, I'm glad I did, rather than I wish I would have. Mm. And, and I think, unfortunately, too much of the time, we live in the space of, I wish I would have. Well, I, was, I was talking to Cheryl on the way in, my best friend. I feel like Oprah talking about Gail. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm so, sure they already know. Cheryl. I know. So I was talking to Cheryl, and she just said, um, can I ask who's answering the phone now? So she phoned yesterday, and Madison's new on staff. and. And I said, well, I think Madison was on the phone yesterday. She goes, very, very nice, but not the usual PSC <clears throat> in her voice, very timid. And I thought, yes, that always, that strength on the phone grows with time. But isn't it interesting she brought it up this morning, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I'm loving Madison as an addition to our team, but that strength and confidence builds. But my job is to have that conversation with Madison today in, in a good way. In a, in a positive way. But some people will tell you about stress in your business for you, right? Mm -hmm. They'll share it with you. And that, and that was just, it's not a big deal. It could be a little hairline fracture, but my job to address it today. Okay, so where else do, where else does stress could be living in my business? The dollar per guest in service could be low. The dollar per guest in take home because we know that that's where so much of our profitability lies. Our rescheduling percentage could be a stress fracture in our business. And here's my favorite. Are we getting better at getting better? Mm -hmm. And if we're not, if we're not seeing improvements, then we have to change something. And so Terry, let's go with that. I don't want you to go quickly past the, the two things that maybe I think people take for granted when we speak. And that's the dollar per guest in service and the dollar per guest in take home. Right now, if you listen to the noise of the industry, there's a lot of talk about a lot of different things. Some of it is what's going on with the, the retail business or the take-home business in the salon sector. And, and, and to that, I want to say you can either uh, listen and, and, and use that as an excuse, or you can take action mm -hmm. and protect home plate. And, and we're going to suggest that you take action and protect home plate, mostly because if we don't, 
the, the overall profitability of the salon is going to be threatened. And, and it is being threatened right now by the fact that people are allowing their businesses to be down in take home sales. And we're blaming it on a lot of external factors when we still have traffic in the salon. We still have there's a captive still, audience. We, they're still sitting in our chairs. Mm -hmm. We're still having 30 to 45 minutes to an hour every single time they sit in our chairs. Statistics prove that they buy within 24 hours, like 86% of the people buy within 24 hours of a salon visit. So if, if you've got 20% of your people that are buying or less while they're in the salon, look what we're leaving on the table. We're inviting that purchase to go somewhere else. And, and so that's a huge stress factor, uh, stress fracture and factor because, say both. Uh, because we're walking into it. We're allowing it to happen. We're allowing the tail to wag the dog in some cases. And, and, mm -hmm. and we've, got to, we've got to address it. Take care of what's in front of us right now. Be the hair professional. Be the person that, that you're the only one that's given a license to give your professional recommendation every single time, every guest, every time from behind the chair. We've got to make sure that happens. Relative to dollar per guest in service, <clears throat> here's a reality check. If we don't take care of this take home situation and, and, and win it back in the salon, then we're going to have to adjust significantly pricing in, our, in the salon industry. We're going to have to. We have allowed increased color business to, uh, to mask the fact that haircut prices haven't kept up. And so that would be the first place that pricing needs to go back to is, is bringing haircut pricing into this century. Uh, and, and, and second of all, think of all the things that you've done in the last 12 to 24 months in order to give a better haircut, better color, better texture service, add additional services, whether it be in the wash house or the color bar, processing menus. Think of all the things that you've added and then look at the scoreboard and say, has it translated into an additional dollar per guest in service in your business? And if it hasn't added on, then where have we traded? Where have we traded dollars? Where have we lessened other services in order to do these, quote, new services? You went to the education, you did the thing, you put in the time of practice in order to increase your, your staff's income and your service dollar per guest. Did it translate? Are you making sure that it, that it gets there? So these are two key areas. Uh, you talk about stress fractures in, in your businesses. That's where your growth is going to come from. Now, there's a lot of other things, processes that are in place with your people, with your internal systems, with your, you know, with your, your computer systems, all of those different things. But, but really where it's measured and, and where that comes from is, did we plan to get a result? What's our return on effort? What's our return on investment in the area of service dollar per guest? and take home dollar for well, guests. You know, it's, uh, this is gonna be a little out there, but I was thinking about it while watching a baseball game last night and CC, you know. Right. Every time he was coming up, we were watching the Yankees last night, and <clears throat> every time he walked in, first thing they said every inning is how many pitches he had in so far, right? Well, he's got 66 pitches in, so I don't know if they'll keep him up there any longer. They know when He's going to, it's going to create stress for him mm -hmm. based on his age. I mean, he's still a great pitcher and everything, but they watch very closely to make sure that they don't overextend him. It's also his first game back from injury. Exactly. So, but how many guests do we put in a chair? I mean, we, without knowing. Without, without knowing. We just put them in there, get them. And we don't know the pitch count. We don't know after how many strikes and balls or dollar per guest and service dollar and take home or what, right? So well, I'm amazed at that. I got a, um, Terry and I both got a message on our, on our Facebook page, uh, Terry and Steve Collin, this morning that came from a client uh, who's been with us for a long time and talked about there's, there's a, a, a movement and there's a lot being said and written about surge pricing in the salon industry. And, and really, it, it, it kind of models after the pricing model for Uber, where at peak times, they're charging more significantly, and they'll tell you right up front, this is a peak time, you're going to pay 
1.5 times the, the, the normal fare, 2.5, 3.5, whatever that is. In some cases, you may pay $75 for a $15 cab ride or a $15 normal ride in non-peak. So this idea of surge pricing, but later on in the, in, in the text, the salon owner said, my stylists are, are scheduled out six to eight weeks in advance. Well, to me, that throws a different flag. It throws a flag that says surge pricing may not be the, the method of choice to solve that problem. I would, I would have to peel the onion back a little bit and say, how long has it been since pricing was raised to begin with? And was it 50 cents or a dollar, or was it the two to five, more like $5 per service, uh, per service provider? Uh, because six to eight weeks, we're not, we're not giving great service to anybody, and surge pricing is just gonna penalize our customer for maybe what we should have uh, been more vigilant to. So. Uh, we'll answer that question directly to the customer, of course, but I just sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, that it, it's it's not as clear as it should be um, that that it's not surge pricing; it's overall pricing structure that's that seems to be broken. In however, this example. okay, so wait, so however, I'd like to add something to that. I mean, if I if I have to have something, I can have it overnight at FedEx, FedEx or whatever for. Twenty-seven dollars additional. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I'm not opposed to thinking about a hairdresser extending their time coming in. She's willing to come in, but the price for this service is going to be this. I think that thinking about people coming in or extending their hours or coming in on their day off could pricing be different because a guest has to get in with someone. That's an option. Well. And it, it is, and it, and it makes sense. It makes sense when Uber does it. Yeah. I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But it's not that they pay more at a non-prime time. They pay less at a non-prime time. They pay more to come in during prime time. Okay, so let's take a look at it. I mean, but this is a whole different... Is there non-prime available for that person? That's the question in a salon setting. Good. I, is, think, I think we can examine this. I, I kind of like it. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking... There's times I've called a salon and said, you know, can I get in? Well, you can only get the haircut, you can't get the color, or you can get the color and you can't get the haircut. But Terry, if she's willing to come in, it's gonna be one, 1. 1.5 times her, her normal fee. You willing to do that? Yes, I am, that's how bad I need it. Thinking about it, don't know. Don't know where I wanna go with that yet, but that's something to consider, yeah? And it might allow people to say, so let's talk about some of the obvious realities of owning a business. I mean, what keeps us up at night? What keeps us up at night? Mm -hmm. Lack of sales, <laughs> yep. right? Not enough cash. Yep. Yep. Too much debt. Yep. Yep. Issues with existing employees. Yep. Mm -hmm. Finding time to scout new talent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Training with commit commitment to new employees versus saying, oh, we don't have time to train them. Well, what's the outcome going to be? So we have all these. And business is stress. You can't escape it. It is stress. Sure. Okay. Well, there's good stress, there's, bad stress, exactly. there's stress that can there, push there's, you. There's, there's a stress, stress that can lay in the street. Stress that creates adrenaline that gets you going. Yeah. Moves you forward. Yes. Okay. So if we think about stress means, and you've heard this many, many times before, Stress means change something or change is trying to take place in your life, mm -hmm. right? So we live by this. Yeah, usually stress in my life is change trying to take place and Terry won't let it. Or, he, no, no, and he's trying to convince me that something needs to change and I'm not convinced yet, so then that creates stress, okay? So you go to the doctor, here we go to the doctor. Because we have stress, or we think we have a stress fracture. Mm -hmm. So you have to tell a good story. Where does it hurt? The reality is no one ever knows. They don't go in saying, I think I have a stress fracture. That's exactly they right. They go in saying it hurts. Something hurts. So where does it hurt right now? Is it, is it the vision? This isn't what I wanted my business to look like. Is it the front of the house and all the operations that go with getting a guest in? Every appointment's wrong. Something's not time frame, pricing. Is it back of the house and the service staff and the talent isn't moving at a, a good rate? Is it training development? Is it finance? Is it future strategy? 
Where does it hurt? Right? Come in the sip of that. That looks good today. What do you think about that page? 1030. Well, hmm. the key thing on this page is, is it takes the, the ability to look at the business almost from the street. You need to see it from the street looking into kind of like the, the model that you said before, where they showed people a house that was in chaos and a house that was, that had order and you were looking down on the model. You almost have to be able to look into your business and not, not be a part of it. That, that object and, and out of business experience. Yes. Right. And out of the four walls experience. Right. So how, how do you do that? Well, uh, again, well, uh, let's give some examples. Make time for it. First of all, I can, and I've said this before, I can walk in and, and the same 30 employees walked in before me. Mm -hmm. Who walked in with garbage in their hand? Mm -hmm. Who fixed the mat? Now other people saw the mat was crooked, or maybe they didn't. I'm gonna guess they didn't. I'm hoping they didn't, is that they saw it and decided not to fix it, that makes me even more frustrated. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Where does it hurt? Why aren't we? When do we look a little sloppy? When does our decision making look sloppy? And here's, here's something that drives me the most nuts, and, and we're guilty of this, overextending ourselves. Then it's time to make some decisions. And because we're late, we try to make the decision too fast. Right? Um, how do I give an example without giving an example? Um, we want to put this new system in place. Okay, we're working on something right now that we spent time on yesterday. And because we wanted it maybe 60 days ago, when we're putting time into it today, we're rushing, we're rushing through it. In my estimation, we're rushing through it. And I can feel the urgency is based on time versus getting it right. Like, uh, we, we don't have time to spend more time on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So what do we do now? We create that. And, and then we can either throw our hands up in the air, which I did a little bit yesterday. I said, okay, I, mean, I don't care. I mean, if, if we're not going to give the effort to getting this thing right versus saying we're running out of time, time can't be the reason because of poor planning to rush through on something. And we do that. We do that with hiring an employee. We do that by, are they moving up a level? Yeah, move them up. Well, have they done everything? Just move them up. Or are we going to bring a new assistant in? And is it time for them to be on the floor? Are they really ready? Yeah, they're, they're ready enough. No, they're not. I mean, you're not ready until you're ready. You can't defend something if, if everything's not in place. So I think sometimes our future strategies and what we're doing is we, we know we need to change it, but we're not giving it the time and attention to really think through it and think of all the options to do it the right way. That's my, that's my opinion. So what is working? The things that we have to think about is, first of all, there's a lot going right in your businesses. Every time you hear our things, you probably think, oh God, maybe every time I listen to a TED talk, I think, well, we suck. Okay, thank you, TED talk today. But what is working? What are the things that you need to celebrate? Things to be grateful for, what we've created thus far. We did this, we accomplished this as a team. Through my leadership, we were able to do all this. And great, and make sure you spend enough time on the what is working. Sometimes I just walk PSC and think, we did all this. This We've done this. We've got 120 people coming this weekend. We got 30 that are gonna be upstairs. We have to, we have figured out how to, through speaking, how to be able to facilitate a whole lot in our building. That's not easy to do. So we accomplish, okay, what's not working? And then you spend time on there. Um, I think sometimes with, with my consulting background or what, what trainers were trained to do and consulting was trained to do in my 20s was find out what's not working and improve upon it. So sometimes my eye, my scanner is looking for what's wrong versus what's right. And so that's a good thing to have as long as you balance it with the other. And sometimes I live too much on 
what's not working versus what is. But sometimes the what's not working is obvious and sometimes what's not working isn't obvious. Okay, so when you think about what's not working in my business right now, why is it not working? Where is it not working? Why is it not working again? And what do I need to do? And sometimes this is all about delegation, timeline deadlines, placing the needs in order of priority. I mean, I always, always have a list of what projects are open. And I, and I brought mine down right now just so you can take a glance at it. Everyone knows the book. I always have a book going on and I'm always writing things. But when you think about all the stuff that you're working on right now, all the open items of your list, whatever they are. I've got three pages that might not look like a big deal, but it's all things that are in my head that I've got to get out on paper. And you've got to have that time to, to get rid of all that that you're carrying up here. And, and this is, I'm hoping, I, I said to Steve this morning, I think you're going to enjoy this part of, part of the conversation. Do not... Let all your ideas and thoughts live only in your brain. Mm -hmm. So if you do not write down and prioritize, your brain can never rest and relax. That creates stress for an owner in itself. Mm -hmm. You never can place it somewhere because I don't have to remember it. I wrote it down. And I know my list is waiting for me. It provides me with confidence. What are my plans? Are we on task, on schedule? I can reformulate I can take a look at um, are we funded or underfunded what repairs are we working on so all those things but if you don't do this all it does is is swirl in your head you're guilty of this this is huge for you especially with all the different places you live yeah. right yeah. And, and you write things down right okay what do you want to say? Well, you're still having trouble sleeping. Stephen, you know, I'm not having trouble sleeping because my mind's not resting. Okay, I'm teasing you. I know, but it's I want to I want to talk about this <laughs> because if it's if it's only living in your brain, that can create stress for you. For sure. All right. So there, and it's it doesn't allow you to say, okay, what are the open issues, and. I think people think they're better just having it the list up in their head versus getting it out. Right? I mean, there's a lot of things you could be working on. Maybe you want to do something different with social media. Maybe you want to do something different with your facility. When are you going to get it done? When are you going to plan? Right? And you should even do this in your personal life. We don't. Right? So guess what? It doesn't get done. Yeah. Right? So I should have a book for personal too. Yeah, I should. You should. I should have one. Um, so here's your tips. Your tips, what is working, what's not working. Make sure you get it out. Get it out somewhere so it's not living. And let's go again. It'll prioritize you. And what are the things? What are we working on? When do we have deadlines? What do we need to get done? I mean, if every week it shouldn't. It shouldn't be something that's open-ended. Also, I love this expression, but when do you call time out in your business? If you're spinning your wheels but not getting anything done, if you're not a completer or if you're not able to finish anything or the same list keeps haunting, haunting you, you've got to go back to the list and create a plan. I love when we're watching a ball game, especially basketball. Steve will say, oh, my God, the wheels are falling off or the wheels are coming off. And... You, you say, call time out, get the team back on the same page. But are there times of the day that's always a stress point for you? And, yeah. and, and what is it? And businesses have that. It could be 3 o'clock is a stress point. Maybe a shift change is a stress point. Maybe they, when they all come in and people start at, at noon or 1 o'clock and someone else has been there since 10, but it just makes us look sloppy. Call time out and say, hey, we gotta change that. That that's not working right now. Right? Well, and how much of the time? <clears throat> excuse me. I think as as owners, you can see, for example, are there times when um, 
you've got people that are taking lunch hour together that, that probably shouldn't be. It's working for them, but you've got a whole department. I, I see this in the school where we've had a whole department that goes to lunch together. They like each other, but but it doesn't serve the business. And is it the right doesn't, decision? Exactly. Even at PSCs, is it the right decision for four directors to take lunch together? I don't know, but it's not even asked. But those are the types of things. Now you see it, but you're working. So do you take the, when do you call the timeout to address it? I think it's it's so hard. A basketball game has the luxury of having to be absolutely sharp for those two and a half yeah, it's Huge intensity. Right. It's huge intensity. And you know right off the bat it's gonna have a beginning and an end. Right. Well and, and our businesses have one too. I mean sometimes every day. I, I'm not expecting the people to be full out. Sometimes we make things take longer than it should be. I, mean, I think a stress point in, in salons still to this day is your guest is here. You knew you had one. So why weren't you out there well, you waiting know, for them? What I'm thinking about from a stress standpoint is, is the, the salon that knows prime time's coming. So maybe they opened at 10 in the morning and prime time starts at 3.30 in the afternoon. All day long, people are working with that expectation. The service desk, the, the assistants, the, the staff itself, knows that that pressure point is coming. How does that affect them during the day? Are we ready when that happens? Are we, are we almost, uh, not regretting, but are we feeling that pressure? Are we really ready to serve when that pressure point hits? Is that the best part of the day or is that the, oh my gosh, it's crunch time? And, 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 and there's a difference, and there's a difference that the guest can feel. We know, just like the, uh, the example you gave of Applebee's last week, uh, we, we had a great server. We had a really, I, I think, exceptional server. But our service went away at a certain point in time in that meal. Because the business got because pushed. Because the business got pushed. Mm -hmm. Instead of the business being ready for that crunch time, that crunch time lessened everything. It was that wasn't our peak experience. Was and and really should it have been? The energy in the restaurant was sky high because it was busy. But how do we do that? Does that happen in the salon? Are we at our best when our salon is full, or are we just pedaling trying to get through it? And what did we do to prepare? And how did we how did we staff to make that happen? Did we have, we have powwow in the morning when there's time for powwow. We have powwow sometimes on a Saturday morning when there's time for powwow. But do we have that little, you know, Terry talks about restaurants having pre-meals, which is the equivalent of a powwow, mm -hmm. right before the dinner hour, before the rush. But, but really, what's it for? It's to be ready for the rush. It's to welcome the rush. And are we welcoming the rush or are we just looking forward to when it ends? That's a big difference. That's a, that's are we welcoming a stress fracture every day? Well, I I, I don't know. You know, I think of of watching um, the restaurant that is a it's a training. It's called the R and D, and it's I think it's part of the Houston's and something something else. But they have their I think I've talked about it in the past. Their whole kitchen is glass, so you see inside, and you can see the expediters, and you can see the staff, and you. Uh, you can see the people behind the line. And what I love about them is you hear them say, here we go now, here we go, bring it up, let's go. And um, the kitchen's going to be pushed right now. This, this, it's just so obvious. But it's not, it's here we go, embracing here we go, not here we go, oh gosh darn it. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that goes with, along with what you said. I think that... Um, the business could really carry busyness as as drama or they can carry busyness as celebration and i i think that that's huge too i also think that teaching people to say do we have any ideas uh, if we had this in place tonight it would have helped us a great deal if we had this in place tonight 
it would have made this experience easier for us to facilitate. Um, even at PSC, I'm constantly thinking, what could we do differently right here? Um, how can we expedite in our building um, for the abnormal? For example, on a regular basis, there isn't 120 people on, on the property receiving education. But when we do, that pushes us out of our element a little bit. And how do we facilitate that? How do we make it easier? How can we make sure that it doesn't look like 120 is too much for us, right? And it's so hard because we don't do it every day. And But we have to make sure we're talking about it so we can make that 120 look as easy as we do when there's not 120 on the property. I mean, we've got to think about differently. We've got to think about parking. We have to think about registers. We have to think about where we're going to help facilitate this. We don't need that kind of room every day. That would be a, a crazy expense for us. But how do we use what we have to facilitate it? And I can tell you, it's a stress point. Um, because some people take it seriously and, and think about the improvements. Other people just say, tell me where you want me to be. Where do you want me to stand? Where do you want me to sit? Not thinking about, hey, we could have tried something different here and it would have made this easier. So you go back to the list and you create the plan. And um, sometimes the plan at PSC is the caterer could have arrived 15 minutes earlier. Sometimes the plan is the caterer could have arrived half hour later. Sometimes the plan is we need more garbage cans, right? It can be that silly of something that'll make it facilitate the event easier. But not always those things are remembered because it's not the norm every day. You have a norm every day. How do you create? And, and people say, we're so good on Saturdays. Well, yeah, you usually have full staff, usually have full, full chairs. And it's easier, so much easier sometimes to be at your best when everyone realizes, hey, we have to be sharp on a Saturday. Well, does that mean you're not sharp on a Wednesday by right. choice? Right. So you go back to the plan and, and you have to say, what, what does the business look like? What are our stress fractures? And, and sometimes it could be, number one, we don't have enough assistance. Um, some of our staff, I mean, one of the things that Tina said the other day when we're meeting is, you know, I've got people that think they're, they should have um, things done for them all the time, even when they have time to do it. They think that it should be done for them, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's not good because that's not someone saying, do I do I create stress for the business or do I relieve stress for the business? Someone that could have helped out and didn't, they created stress for the business. Right, but what you're saying is, is that things being done when they don't need it. Right. When they need it, it it's obvious that it needs to be done. Well, you know, but what is, what's our system? You're, you're right. I mean, the other night I was getting ready to leave and I, I think I gave you this example. Um, the educator stayed longer or ended his class later. So by the time he was done, um, Joseph DiMaggio was here. By the time he was done, our staff was primarily gone for the day. Mm -hmm. So that left, Brian, were you here? I can't remember. It was so Wednesday. It was here, I didn't close up. I think it was Tuesday night. So. So I came down, I was walking down, it was quiet, and I thought everything must be fine, but the first thing, last thing I'm gonna do before I leave is to see if anyone needs anything. And that's something else people don't do. I think I've given this example too. People stay with their purse on their shoulder, keys in their hands, coat on, gloves on. Does it, you need anything? No, I'm not gonna ask you to get totally undressed, but help me out. So anyway, I walked downstairs and, and I said, how are you, what are you, what are you doing? Well, we're turning the room over. We have a whole different class tomorrow. I said, oh my goodness, I wasn't aware of that. What's your plan for tonight? This, 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 and this. And I said, well, you don't have enough resources. So tell me where you want me. And then I called Lou and I said, Lou, we need some, we need some sweat equity in here for a few minutes before you leave. So what's the plan? What do you need? And not everyone's going to ask. Our point saying earlier, not everyone's going to say, 
hey, do you need anything? Don't just sneak out the front door hoping you didn't get them before they left. Even if they're not sneaking. Sneaking says they know there was something. Some <laughs> people don't know. Some people don't know that there's uh -huh. a fire going on. And, you know, there again, the, the thing that I'd say is I, I know that relative to that department, your mantra is 30 days out, 30 days out, 30 days out. So in some ways, if if a fire is happening regularly, then we aren't anticipating the fire. We certainly didn't expect him to be an hour late, right? Joseph. Darn Joseph, it. darn it. But it was, a, it was a good 30 minutes. It was, it was great. I mean, he was, really it was wonderful. However, you know, when you look at it, turning that whole room over required so much. And Trish was carrying it in her head. And, and this stuff happens in your businesses too. I'm not saying it doesn't, but where are we? What do we need to do? I mean, we had to turn all the stations over, mannequin heads, tripods had to come in, all the floors had to be mopped and, and swept and everything had to be rearranged and done. I'm not gonna ask two people to do that, mm -hmm. right? That was way too much for them. And then afterwards they said, thank you so much. Are you serious? I, you don't thank me. I, I work here too. Mm -hmm. So, but had, had Lou and I not caught that before we walked out the door, they would have been here another hour at least. And imagine the self-talk. Oh yeah. Well, I was darn it, where is everybody? Sure. You know, and, it would, and some so of the, the things feeling that- feeling of being alone. Well, some of the situation. things that Lou lifted, those girls should never have lifted. And, but you're right. As soon as he went over, Trish should start making phone calls. I might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit too much for Callie and I after we're done tonight. Right? Do yep. we do that enough? Do we say we could be in a little bit of trouble? What do you need? All right. Those are good examples. All right. The difference between good and great. I kept this from last month because I loved it. And we heard it from a coach. The difference between good and great. Great doesn't get tired. And great doesn't get stressed. Because they feel the stress beforehand and start making the changes or the plan changing the plan to help them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm, I'm tired every day of my life. Everyone knows that. Um, we were talking, I have to do a, a, a motivational speech. Sunday, Sunday morning at eight o'clock a.m. Are you serious? Those of you that know Terry are falling off your chairs right yeah, now. You want me to motivate at 8 a.m.? Seriously, someone should be motivating me at 8 a.m. Someone suggested that I keep Terry up all night, an all-nighter, so that she thinks it's an evening yes, class. No, I think I'm going to bed. So I said, who in their right mind scheduled me at 8? And Steve said, Terry, had I known, I would have told them. No, not the right time. However, that's, that's the straw. You I was, that persona. Well, that was You've the part I was dealt. This so is your motivator. I, yeah, we're going to open up with, with her. So... Even that is going to create stress for us at home. I mean, we'll laugh. Even when we, when we speak and we're traveling, how do you wake me up? You go, come on, motivator. Mm -hmm. Get up. Because he hits the ground just like this all the time. And I have to and ease into the day. A little, a little step here and there. I hate it. I hate it. My whole life I've been like that. And, you know, I laugh because when I first met my the doctor that told me people with thyroid conditions are always tired, especially in the morning. I said, this is my favorite doctor ever in the world, this endocrinologist. And I thought, oh my God, you get it. Because they said it's like being at a slumber party every single day until you get into your day and, and feel, that, feel that energy. Mm -hmm. That's why it's not my favorite time of the day. Just thought I'd share that. So anyway, in your business, when is your business tired? Are you guys great starters? Are you more the closers? Are you the second half? Where is the strength in your business? People that say, man, I am such a morning person. I mean, I've never uttered those words in my life. But is your business a morning person? You know, when, is, when are you at your best? And that's when I look at hours sometimes and think, when a business is open and you have to deliver that kind of service 64 hours a week, I think, seriously, and you have to have leadership in there 64 hours a week, I think you're asking a whole lot. And those, 
that's why when I change the hours sometimes of salons and help them, they're saying, man, I can manage this. I've never been able to manage the other hours, but I can manage this. And I can give this great effort 40 hours a week or 45 mm -hmm. hours a week versus 64. But that she knows. Okay. What else do we want to say? I mean, what are your stress points at the school? Our, our morning appointments and our afternoon appointments for the main clinic floor. The first ones? We have the first one in the morning, it's usually around <clears throat> 10 to 10, 15. And then our one o'clock. So isn't that why? Because you also have congestion now? It's, yeah. It's all based it, on it, congestion. It's, it's a stress point. Okay. And then there's future professionals that are ready. Uh, they're guest ready. And there's future professionals that aren't guest ready. Well, I can tell you in the restaurant, I remember, um, I don't know what we call it back then, but we said, why do we look so sloppy at the beginning? Because everyone's coming in for that six o'clock dinner, right? And so we said, hey, servers. You cannot, you've got to help us at six o'clock. We get killed. The same two people, once the dining room is filled, they can refill it with these. It's mm -hmm. that first fill that's so hard. Can some of you that aren't filled yet come out and take your tables too and say, hey, I'll be serving you tonight right this way. Take some pressure off that, off that front. Some people don't even look up and think, hey, that's your job, you're the hostess instead of saying, how can we take pressure off? So that congestion, that front congestion should always be, if you're available, go assist. Well, in the school world, you've got congestion that happens at least twice, if not three times with every guest. Oh, I that, that's, that. that's planned congestion. One is when they check in, and that time that exists to check in before they're seated, the other is after they're seated and, that and the consultation that mm -hmm. has to take place because every learning leader has a zone of anywhere from six to 12 people in their zone. Mm -hmm. So that's oh. six to 12 consultations that literally need to happen simultaneously. And that's impossible, of course, for one person to be in 12 spots at once. So there's going to be congestion there. And then the other congestion is at checkout time mm -hmm. because you've got the whole school uh, that's, that's going through a checkout situation. So, so those are at least three congestion points that are going to take place. In the Can you automate it? That all? creates stress. We're working to automate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, if we have someone walking with an iPad and being able mm -hmm. to facilitate, it might it might assist. Yeah. Good. We done. I like this topic. It's a little it's a little thick, I think, because usually the stress points could be lack of follow up could be uh, being able to give it its full attention, full attention, a, a subject matter, versus uh, this is a maybe a, a three hour discussion and we've got a half hour to do it. Okay. Um, and remember, going back to the, <clears throat> the original definition, it's accumulated stress or trauma that happens from repeated activities. Oh, no, we're the same thing. And, and so the, the real gist of this isn't an isolated situation that takes place no. that's obvious to fix in the salon, like if we had a broken shampoo bowl, or if the computer crashed, God forbid. That's a single incident. These are things that happen, unfortunately, every guest every time or every day or at certain points throughout the day. So it, it's that repeated that, uh, you know, sometimes we walk into it over and over again. It's like, oh my God, this again, this again. I, I still haven't fixed this. We still haven't got this solved. Well, I think in, in our company, uh, I'll close with this on my side, but in our company, um, years ago, Lou, I, I always think about this. We had these weeds, mm -hmm. right? And they were next to the building. And I said, Lou, I'm getting ready to leave town. Please, these weeds look real sloppy. They're kind of up to maybe my calf or something. I said, please, can we get these done before I return? I can't believe we look like this. We're better than that. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, we fly back in after being gone. I think we were, at, it was in July, so we were probably at, at the gathering for Paul Mitchell. So we got returned, and now the weeds are up to my thighs. And I said, Lou. He said, Terry, 
I swear to God, we sprayed for the weeds. We sprayed. I said, oh, good. I'm so glad you told me that. Because I think we should put a sign up that says, sorry we look so bad, but we sprayed. Honest to God, we sprayed. Is, is that sarcasm? Yeah, a little bit. And I, I said, so even at PSC sometimes when people will say, well, that lives, well, I put it on the drive or I put it on my, that's equivalent to we sprayed. It doesn't matter that, that we sprayed. It matters that the weeds were gone. And sometimes staff will say, well, I called all the customers. Well, how do we know that we made contact with them? So that's when, when, I, when I struggle with that. Even at PSC, if we go, we tried to reach them to see if we could ship that out to them, and no one got back to us, so we just didn't ship it. Did we try every other way that we could have? Or are we living with doing, hey, I did my part. And sometimes I see that attitude really living in a, in a lot of businesses. Hey, I did my part. It's up to everyone else who screwed it up, mm -hmm. even the customer. But difference between good and great. Great doesn't get tired. And great manages stress. doesn't get stressed because they know they're going to have it, but they've decided how they're going to manage it. Perfect. Happy business. Thanks so much. All have right. a great month. Bye-bye.